Globalisation is everywhere. It is essential for geography teachers to understand the intricacies of globalisation as people around the globe become more connected than ever before. But it doesn't just affect global business and politics, it's on your street, in the news and in every cup of coffee you drink. We've tracked down three experts at the cutting edge of globalisation to give you the lowdown on what it is, how it affects your city and how maps really will change the way we see the world. Diane Swift works for the Geographical Association. She used to be a geography teacher, advisor and inspector and is now involved in professional development projects for other geography teachers. It's a really exciting time for geography and particularly geography in schools at the moment and I think one of the key things is enabling kids to use their geographical learning when they're listening to things on the news or when they're looking at pictures or videos about places both near and far. So one of the excitements is them being able to use geography to inform their thinking about contemporary events. Globalisation is like many of geography's key concepts, it's continually being developed so it's very hard to capture it in a, a key definition. But I guess for us globalisation is about interconnectedness and interdependence between places, the connections that happen when one event happens in one place and the repercussions it has for others. It's been something that's underpinned geography for a substantial amount of time. But I guess the term globalisation is being used more often in common parlance, on the news, um, in newspapers. So maybe it's that people are discovering geography as offering something new, rather than it being a new idea within geography. One of the, I guess, very powerful ways of looking at globalisation are using tools like Google Earth to zoom in and out and to connect knowledge. Um, so when you're dealing with controversial issues or difficult issues to teach in the classroom, something like race, kids can come thinking that an area is dominated perhaps by an ethnic minority. And then you use um, scale to zoom in and out and actually to make the figures um, accessible to them, to show them spatial distributions on a map. And suddenly they develop a whole different understanding of that issue and are actually able to contribute to a conversation in a different way to that that perhaps they previously might have done. Teaching geography is a real um, privilege and using a concept like globalisation makes it all the more powerful, um, particularly when you see kids connect the learning that they've done in the classroom um, with their everyday lives. So when youngsters come to you and they tell you a story about how they've made a decision to buy one thing and not the other, based on the understanding that they've developed through the teaching and learning that they've done in their geography lessons, that can be a very special moment, a real eureka moment, and um, one of the real delights of teaching geography. <laughs> Saskia Sassen is Professor of Sociology at the University of Chicago and London School of Economics. She is internationally recognised for her analyses of globalisation and her books have been translated into 13 languages. Globalisation is many things. The most visible part is the consumer side, the McDonald's everywhere, the fact that people want to have Nike shoes, athletic shoes everywhere. That is a very different kind of globalization from that of finance. Finance moves through private, invisible, inaccessible geographies, mostly electronic. When I was working on globalization, I, I was unhappy with the notion that the global is out there. I coined the term global city to bring it down to the ground, to say, you know what, it's happening right here inside our countries, not just outside the country. It is concrete, it is specific, we can go study it. It's there, on the street, in those buildings, in those infrastructures for connectivity. You know, in the last 10 years, Shanghai, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, uh, Taipei, all kinds of cities have joined the club of global cities. There are about 40 global cities in the world. And it is a space of power, of global corporate capital, 
but it is also a space where migrants, where people from all kinds of different countries come together and encounter each other in ways that they would never back home. London has just achieved that very special condition, especially central London, I'm thinking now, which is denationalized, you know. That's an interesting way of being very much part of a country, but really a stage for all kinds of international actors. You know, they always say that Wimbledon, Wimbledon, is, it's an English court, but the winners are always foreigners. You know, it's the Wimbledon effect. London is a super Wimbledon effect. You know, that there is a stage and some of the major players in all kinds of fields are foreigners. But you also see it in the, in the physical landscape. The city of London, which is, you know, the UK's ultimate financial center, Many of those buildings are owned by Germans, by Japanese, by Taiwanese. When you just look at the who owns the buildings of London's premier financial center, it's totally international. When you then try to find out, well, who works here? The Japanese, the Americans use London as a platform to work on the continent in Europe. So that is one thing that you pick up. You pick it, up, of course, up in, in global tourism that we have tourists from all over the world. You pick it up in your neighborhood if you live in central London. You know that there are foreign professionals living there who come regularly every year, maybe for six months, or are there for two years. You just pick it up in many different things. The impact of globalization on a city like London is, uh, is of two sorts. One is good. Good because it brings enormous dynamism. A city like London was dying. It was in fiscal crisis, it was losing jobs, it was losing share of national economic activity and wealth. And then comes globalization. And suddenly, all kinds of powerful firms need to be in London. American firms, Japanese firms, French firms, etc. And so you have this enormous expansion of real estate. But it's also bad. It's bad because these are such powerful actors, these firms, that they displace firms and households who can no longer compete with those very powerful actors. So it tears apart an old civic fabric that these cities had. And the challenge is, how do we reinvent the civic space of the city under these conditions? Academics from Sheffield University have been working alongside experts from the University of Michigan on a groundbreaking project. Professor Danny Dawling and research assistant Anna Barford work in Sheffield's Human Geography Department. For the last 15 years, Danny has been building an extraordinary picture of global inequalities through a series of innovative maps. Uh, it's important that we draw maps of inhumanity now because the world is changing so quickly and if we don't see in which direction it's going, our chances of doing something about it are relatively small. So we need to have a look at just how unequal this world is, how quickly it's becoming more unequal, and get a grip on our lifestyles and what we're doing and how we're treating other people very quickly, or the consequences are not particularly nice. Teachers need to be teaching inequality and the extent of inequality around the world because it's basically the way in which we study poverty nowadays. We no longer have an idea that there are some people who are poor and if you give them a bit more money they'll stop being poor. Poverty essentially is inequality. Um, it's not being able to do what is normal in your society what other people can do. And so if you want to understand poverty across the world and in the countries, you need to understand inequality. World Mapper is a collection of 365 maps of what we think are about the most important things in the world at the moment. It was made possible because around the turn of the millennium, the United Nations agencies got very excited about trying to release data to do with the Millennium Development Goals. And so the quality of the data that became available meant that for the first time we could draw reliable maps of people in almost all countries of the world. People tend to be quite shocked by seeing this information, the way it's presented, because what we do is we draw maps which make each country the size of what it is we're showing. This pair of maps shows clothing trade around the world. So the top map shows the net clothing exports and the bottom map shows the net clothing imports. So as you can see from the top map, the value of net exports from places like China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, India, Pakistan are very large and the net exports from these countries are almost non-existent so the Americas really produce 
very little of the net closing trade. Yeah, we'll put it another way. If it wasn't for these people here, these people here wouldn't be wearing clothes. Um, this shows globalisation because it shows if these have got net imports and these have got net exports, then there's got to be a general mm. movement from east to west of clothing. One of the maps in World Mapper shows the numbers of people who are dying of AIDS by making the countries the size of the number of people dying. Basically, the map is taken over by large parts of Africa and a bit of India. Now, this is a map which is not just about the disease, it's also about money, because a lot of people in the United States had AIDS and have AIDS, but they can afford the drugs that keep them alive. So if you like, this is a map, which is a map not just of a disease, but a map of money and a map of attitudes to different folk, which wouldn't be like that if we didn't have racism. It's quite difficult to understand geography without understanding race and racism. Uh, racism is a very, very new concept. In Britain, the word wasn't used until the 1960s. It doesn't appear in dictionaries. Um, and it's important to realise just how new some forms of racism are and how they're linked uh, to geographical movements of people and to people who want to increase fear and prejudice who are simply frightened of what's going on in the world. This issue of race gets even sharper under the context of globalization because of the diversity of outsiders that a community deals with and because that community, and this is critical, feels threatened by globalization. They have lost jobs, they have lost uh, presence in the city, etc. So they are already threatened and we see that it's the vulnerable communities that are often the most likely to become very, very dubious about all these outsiders, all these other religions. So it, it shrinks the mind, ironically. In the global era, you see a lot of people shrinking their minds, sort of moving away from, I don't want to deal with this. To the average person on the street, globalization can mean many things. It depends who that average person on the street is. If you're a human rights activist, globalization means that one tortured body becomes a global media event. If you're a consumer who is addicted to McDonald's, you know that even if you go to China, you're going to be able to get a McDonald's. To others, it means gentrification. You know, all these wealthy international firms and international professionals are moving into your neighborhood and you're out. People do not necessarily think of this as globalization, but it is a function of globalization. Globalization is very much a, a cutting edge concept because I think it enables people to think very powerfully spatially, um, perhaps about the spatial consequences of decisions. Uh, so, if, for example, I was travelling not so long ago on a, a train and someone was talking about whether they bought as a present um, a diamond or a goat. So I guess globalisation would enable them to think uh, in a very informed way about the global impact of buying a diamond or buying a goat as a present for someone. And then using that information, they could perhaps make their decision in a different way to that that they previously would have done. Globalization is a live reality. It's a reality in the making, and as far as I can see, we're only at the beginning of a new history.